I think sort of the irony of this paper is that it's, this is supposed to have been part three of a single article. I mean, the initial idea was I wanted to complexify the story of uh, the vesting clause thesis, as it's traditionally been called, um, with a presentation of a counter perspective on executive power that I ran into more or less by accident in the course of some other research. And the process of really trying to nail it down and honestly of trying to find counter evidence for my own thesis ended up um, extending the research out further and further and further. So. Big picture, the research is grounded in an awful lot of reading. Um, I have read something like a thousand um, different texts from the 17th and 18th century with the predecessor paper to this one. Um, I've personally gone through the entire um, documentary history of the ratification of the Constitution, uh, uh, looking for every instance of the word wrote EXEC. I have teams of RAs over the past five years now, I think it is, working through the journals of the Continental Congress um, and the letters of delegates to the Continental Congress doing the same search and sort of flagging hot docs for me. So there's been um, a lot of effort that's gone into this and I'll be interested to hear your reactions. I think um, the best way to situate the project or the thesis of the project is to emphasize just how important the function was that is vested by the Article II vesting clause, that is to say, um, a, a pretty frequent line of um, skepticism about the law bound or law execution vision of the presidency is to suggest that it renders the president a factotum, uh, it renders the president uh, uh, beneath contempt, um, you know, errand boy, messenger boy, that kind of um, uh, formulation. And I think that that radically misreads the, um, the politics of the period that radically misreads the hard sale of the Constitution itself. Uh, the core problem um, uh, that they wrestled with, among many, um, was the fundamental problem, certainly at the national level, of being able to execute the projects that the Congress decided on. And that frustration with failures of execution is just uh, immensely dominant uh, throughout uh, the, the, the run-up to the, to, the, to the convention, throughout the convention itself, and then during um, the ratification process. The anti-federalists, so to speak, um, are worried that the Constitution goes too far. Um, they're worried that, um, that, you, you're, that, that, that a bazooka has been brought out where a, a rifle would have been better. Um, and the hard sale that the federalists push is um, that, that, that the, the vesting clause, um, that the Constitution, I should say, fixes this execution problem. So in that respect, I, I just want to like at the outset suggest, I, I, some people have misread this line of emerging series of papers that is turning into a book, and I want to say about that, something about that in a moment, as arguing for a weak presidency, um, or in some respects, like with, when it comes to some highly salient contemporary controversy, sort of cite some piece of this or another and say like, see this thing that this academic has written shows that what Trump did was um, against the understanding of the founders, and I think in some cases that is true, but in a lot of cases it isn't, right? Like the, the, the key um, uh, upshot for the executive power, uh, from my perspective, is that it's an empty vessel in a sense that's both um, weak, I suppose, but also potentially immensely strong. And that's why Madison ties the power of the president so closely to, the, t the potential for tyranny of the president, so closely to the kind of decisions that the legislature will make. Okay, um, maybe from here it makes sense to quickly sort of summarize the conceptual structure that I'm suggesting is frankly uncontradicted in the materials, at least as I have read them, and then turn it over to Ilan for, um, for, 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 for comments. The thing that you need to understand um, is that amidst enormous debate about how governance should be structured, enormous debate and anxiety about what the right terms of the separation of powers were, um, immensely varying views on um, the good, the nature of representation, what it meant to secure rights. The question with which this paper and this series of papers uh, engages is at the end of the day uh, a question of conceptual vocabulary. And it really wasn't contested. Again, not that I have seen at any point in any of the reading that, I, in any of the reading that I've done. They might contest and argue and disagree furiously about what powers the executive should have, the president should have, the governor should have. Immense disagreement about that. No disagreement at all that I have seen and like pervasive agreement 
about the proposition that the great powers of government were the legislative, judicial, and the executive, and that these great powers of government formed an interlocking sequence from instruction or formulation of authoritative intent to its operationalization or execution in the real world. And um, they spoke of this interlocking sequence of, uh, of functions as uh, the existence of complete government, of perfect government. They were clear that anybody at any level of government could have, or any level of government could have complete government as to those subject matter competences over which they had control. So there's a firm distinction between the notion of subject matter competences, commerce, war, patents, and functions. Functions being the legislative authority over what? Over patents, to formulate intentions, rules, and structures relating to patents. And then the executive power to bring into being the instructions so formulated and so executed. So, on that background, um, the executive power clause um, creates, uh, in a very express way, something that in fact did exist, and although it's sometimes misunderstood not to have existed, but did exist under the Continental Congress, um, which is to say an authority for execution. An authority for execution, an authority and express uh, unitary um, in the very top level sense, I suspect we'll talk more about that, um, uh, uh, locus of um, operationalization of legislated intent. And that's why the vesting clause was treated as unbelievably straightforward throughout the ratification process, at the conventions, in the pamphleting, um, even while foes are hyperventilating about other powers of the president and, in, and inveighing against prerogative powers in any number of ways, they don't once mention the possibility that some portion of those powers sits secretly in the first clause of Article 2. And in a whole sequence of like dissertation uh, treatise-style marches through the clauses of the Constitution, most famously the Federalists, but not only the Federalists, and not only by Federalists, but also by Anti-Federalists, nobody talks about the vesting clause as being really worth any discussion at all. Um, and so the upshot of all this is a president with actually very few specified powers in the Constitution. There really isn't a lot there. And by far the most important one in terms of the substantive authority to the person we have going forward was the authority to execute those um, uh, responsibilities and obligations that were conveyed to the president by Congress. And, and that sort of, that pivots to the, to the book project this is, this is, this is turning into. Um, thinking through a whole range of issues um, on which this basic structure of government um, bears, uh, certainly non-delegation, there's a paper that I know at least some of you know about that's out now discussing uh, implications for the non-delegation doctrine, unitary executive doctrine, oversight relationship between Congress and the executive branch, um, what to do about emergencies, uh, a weird but persistent suggestion that powers of the president are defeasible, um, uh, uh, perhaps even those that were specified in the Constitution itself. The book is going to sort of build from the core of this claim about the most important grant of power to the president, and then work out, including with reference to um, political practice in the first 10 years of the Republic, um, how they deploy these concepts and this basic framework in handling some of the great issues of their day.